I am happy to introduce uh, Jason Parker from uh, Brandon University, uh, who is going to talk uh, on uh, covariant isot isotropy of Grothendieck toposis. So please uh, go ahead. Great. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, so I'm Jason Parker, uh, and um, I, I just FYI, um, I do sometimes uh, stutter or stammer. So if you hear me stuttering or uh, or stammering, that's uh, to, to, to totally normal. Um, so yes, so I'm talking about uh, covariant isotropy of Grotendieck uh, to toposis. Um, so I'll just uh, start with some kind of background. Um, whoops, I have to get that going. Okay. Yeah. So so basically. Uh, Kerbin isotropy is a, is a um, somewhat recent uh, categorical construction that basically uh, gives a uh, 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 an abstract notion of conjugation or inner automorphism for an arbitrary category. Oh, I think I have a okay. So basically, um, in prior work uh, with uh, Peter Kofstra and Phil Scott, um, we use techniques from categorical logic to characterize the uh, covariant isotropy group. Of any locally finitely presentable category C, and in particular of any pre sheaf category. Um, so, in this talk, we'll first give an overview uh, of covariant isotropy and then show that its characterization for any pre sheaf category basically extends to any Grotendieck topos. And this is uh, based on my recent uh, pre preprint uh, with the same title uh, as this talk uh, that's currently on the archive. Okay, so just to um, to first motivate uh, this uh, this uh, topic. Um, so basically, uh, George Bergman proved in a certain paper from I think 2012 that the inner automorphisms of groups can be characterized purely categorically as the group automorphisms that extend naturally along any group uh, morphism out of the domain. So uh, to see this first. Observe that if I have say an inner automorphism alpha of some group G induced by some element S in G, then for any group morphism F from G to some further group H, uh, we can push forward alpha along F to define a further inner automorphism alpha sub F of the codomain H uh, simply by conjugation with F of S and H. So therefore in particular, if I push alpha along the identity on G, we just have alpha. Now this family of automorphisms that I obtained from the, uh, the starting uh, inner automorphism alpha is coherent in the sense that if I have any group uh, homomorphisms F from G to G prime, and then F prime from G prime to G prime prime, then th the following square will always commute. So we have alpha sub F on the top, uh, alpha sub F prime after F on the bottom, and F prime on either side. So basically, if I push forward these uh, or the inner automorphism alpha along uh, F and then along F prime after F, um, then those are kind of extended or, or uh, those pushed forward inner automorphisms will be coherent in this sense. Okay. <clears throat> so for group G, let's call an arbitrary family of automorphisms. Um, with the above naturality property, an extended inner automorphism of G. So concretely, this is a family of group automorphisms, uh, one for each group morphism out of G on the codomain of that morphism. And these are all coherent with each other. And now I don't assume a priori that uh, these are induced by a starting inner automorphism of G. So this is just uh, an arbitrary family of automorphisms on the codomains of all the group morphisms out of G that are coherent uh, in the sense on the previous uh, slide. So th this is just a natural automorphism of the projection functor from the group G uh, slice group to group. So Bergman proved that uh, if I have any automorphism alpha of a group G, then alpha is an inner automorphism. So it's, it's induced uh, by conjugation with some element if and only if there is an extended inner automorphism in this above sense that induces alpha. So whose, whose component at the identity on G is just alpha it, itself. So we just saw that um, if alpha is inner, then it induces any such extended inner automorphism. But the converse is also true that if I give you any 
arbitrary extended inner automorphism of a group G, then it must come from an inner automorphism in the conjugation theoretic sense of the starting group G. So basically this gives a completely uh, categorical characterization of inner automorphisms of groups. They're exactly those group automorphisms that can be coherently or functorially extended along group homomorphisms out of the uh, d -d domain. Okay, so how does this uh, relate to or kind of inspire uh, covariant isotropy? So we have a functor Z from group to group that sends any group G to its group of extended inner automorphisms. And these do form a group. So we refer to Z as the covariant isotropy group functor of the category group. And actually Bergman's theorem shows that this is in fact isomorphic to the identity functor uh, on the category group. So in fact, any arbitrary category C has its own covariant isotropy group functor, ZC, that sends each object, uh, C, to its own group of extended inner automorphisms. So these are uh, families of automorphisms, uh, one automorphism on the codomain of each arrow out of the object that, that are coherent with each other uh, in the sense uh, as described on a prior slide. So these are just natural automorphisms of the projection functor from the slice category under the object to the category. So, so basically, again, these are just families of automorphisms, uh, one automorphism on each uh, or um, on the codomain of each arrow out of the object that are natural or, or uh, co co coherent. Okay. So we can turn Bergman's characterization of inner automorphisms in group into a definition of the notion of inner automorphism in an arbitrary category C. So if, if we have an object C and an automorphism alpha of C, then we can define alpha to be inner just if it's uh, induced by an extended inner automorphism. So if there is an extended inner automorphism uh, whose component at the identity on C is alpha. So b b basically this is saying that um, alpha is inner just if it can be coherently extended along any arrow out of the object. So group is the category of models of an algebraic or equational theory. Uh, so just a set of equational axioms b b between terms in the sense of categorical logic. So um, in prior work, we basically uh, j -j -j generalized ideas from the proof of this result of Bergman to give a logical characterization of the inner and extended inner automorphisms in this more categorical sense of the uh, category of models um, of any finitary quasi-equational theory T. Oh, I have, okay. Uh, so yes, okay. Oops, there we go. Okay, so just I'll, I'll just give some background on those quickly. Um, so a finitary quasi-equational theory T um, in the sense of the paper by Palmgren uh, and Vickers called, I think, partial horn logic and Cartesian categories. Uh, so it's over a multi-sorted finitary uh, equational signature. So it has just sorts and operation symbols. So it's a set of implications called the axioms, uh, which are between um, finitary horn formulas, which are just uh, conjunctions of equations between uh, terms. Now, the kind of relevant feature of this um, or of these theories, um, and, and these are also known as say Cartesian theories or essentially algebraic theories, is that the operations symbols may only be partially defined. So we have a term T, we'll write T down arrow uh, as an abbreviation for T equals T, meaning that T is defined. So this is uh, not always a theorem of um, the given uh, underlying logic. So now if we have any regular cardinal lambda, then one can define um, an extension of these theories to, to lambda. So we can define say a lambda area quasi-equational theory T, uh, in the same way, but now allowing for uh, operations with possibly um, lambda arity and then also lambda arity uh, conjunctions. Okay, so just to give some examples of these, 
So any algebraic theory is a finitary quasi-equational theory, as are the fifth theories of categories, groupoids, stripped monoidal categories, and any pre-sheaf category. Now for this talk, so if we have a small site, uh, then the Rotendieck topos uh, on that site is in fact the category of models for a lambda area quasi-equational theory. Uh, where lambda is the smallest regular cardinal larger than any of the uh, sieves. Uh, so the sorts are the objects of, of C. Uh, for any arrow F, I have a unary operation symbol going in the opposite direction. And for any covering sieve uh, J, we have a, a lambda array operations symbol sigma J uh, of that uh, typing. And then you have axioms expressing the contravariant functoriality and the fact that any matching family has a unique amalgamation. So therefore the models of this uh, theory are exactly the sheaves on the site. Okay, so now I will just uh, kind of uh, briefly give an overview of the main results uh, for covariant isotropy of, of uh, Cartesian or quasi-equational theories. So let's fix a lambda area quasi-equational theory over a lambda area signature, and we have its category of models, uh, T mod. So uh, again, I'll just review the, the characterization of its covariant isotropy group, uh, which was achieved for finite area theories uh, in prior work and extended to uh, lambda area uh, in my recent uh, preprint. So basically, using the quasi-equational syntax of T, one can uh, de define a notion of definable automorphism for a model M of T. And these then form a group, uh, def in of M. So if T is a uh, single sorted, uh, for simplicity, um, then given any model M, one can form the T model, uh, M bracket X, obtained from M by freely adjoining an indeterminate element X. So the elements of this model can be uh, seen as congruence classes of terms involving X regarded as a new constant and, and also constants from the model M. And here two terms are congruent if they are provably e e equal in the diagram theory of the model extended by uh, this axiom saying that this new constant is defined. So the diagram theory of, of M extends T by basically adding constants from the model M and axioms expressing the relations that hold in M. Okay, so if we have some, some element bracket T in M bracket X, we say it's substitutionally invertible if there is some possibly other element bracket S in this model uh, that is basically the substitutional inverse of T with respect to this, this diagram theory plus X. So if we substitute S for X in T, we get just X in the diagram theory and conversely. If we have, say, um, uh, an operation symbol of sigma, then a given element bracket T and M bracket X uh, commutes generically with F if uh, T of M with X1 through Xn proves this sequence. So first of all, this model is just the diagram theory extended by N new pairwise distinct constants, which are all defined. And then this sequence basically is expressing that if F applied to this N tuple of new constants is, is uh, defined, then if I substitute it for X in T, that is equal to F applied to these uh, sort of N um, variants of T. So basically this is uh, supposed to express that T is commuting or that T commutes in a sort of generic sense with this operation symbol F. Uh, and likewise, um, this uh, congruence class bracket T will reflect definedness of F if this same theory proves this sequence, which basically says that um, if T with F of this tuple for X is defined, then so is F of this tuple. So this is again expressing that this, this, uh, this congruence class bracket T reflects definedness of F in this uh, ge generic sense. Okay. So we can then define uh, a group, so def in of M to be the group of all of these elements, bracket T uh, in M bracket X that are substitutionally invertible and commute generically with and reflect definedness of every uh, uh, 
operation symbol of, of the signature sigma. So basically, uh, this is um, the group of definable automorphisms of M, where we regard um, uh, an element bracket T in this, in this T model as uh, inducing a definable automorphism if it satisfies uh, these properties. Okay, and if T is multi-sorted, one can extend the above uh, the, the definitions appropriately. So basically, the, you just have to, uh, of course, account for the, the um, possibly many sorts, which is not too hard to do. Um, and that is shown uh, in um, certain of the uh, references. Okay. So then we proved uh, in prior work that um, if we have a, a lambda area quasi equational theory, then, then for any model M of this theory, its covariant isotropy group, so its group of extended inner automorphisms, is actually isomorphic to its group of definable inner um, uh, automorphisms. So, and then in, in prior work, namely uh, in this uh, initial paper, isotropy of algebraic theories, we use this result to show that the sort of inner automorphisms categorically defined in many uh, categories of algebraic structures like monoids, uh, groups, and abelian groups, non commutative rings, et cetera, are exactly the sort of conjugation theoretic inner automorphisms that you would expect. So in this sense, uh, covariant isotropy does actually provide kind of a generalized uh, notion of inner automorphism for a category. Checking the time. Okay. So for pre sheaf categories, so uh, in a recent uh, paper, uh, we also characterized the covariant isotropy group of any pre sheaf category for, of course, a, a small category C. So we have a pre-sheath F, and we show that the group of definable automorphisms of F uh, consists up to isomorphism of exactly the natural automorphisms alpha of F induced by some element psi in the automorphism group of, of the identity functor on C. So here psi is a natural automorphism of the identity functor on C. And to say that alpha is induced by psi means that the component of alpha at any object of C is just the, the, uh, the functor F applied to the component of psi at C. So basically, the, the, um, the, so this shows that the only inner automorphisms of pre-sheaves are those induced by a natural automorphism of the identity functor on the base category. So it then follows that, that the covariant isotropy group functor of any pre sheaf category is actually a constant on the automorphism group of the identity functor uh, of the, the index category. Okay, so now um, in my recent preprint, I wanted to, to see if this would extend to arbitrary Grotin dictopuses or sheaf categories. Um, so to start, uh, for certain convenient uh, technical reasons, I first uh, just, uh, just examined uh, subcanonical sites where no object is covered by the empty sieve. So basically, uh, for any object C, the empty sieve uh, is not um, a covering sieve of C. Okay. So then if uh, F is any sheaf over such a site, I show that uh, its group of definable inner automorphisms uh, consists up to isomorphism of exactly those natural automorphisms alpha of F uh, induced by some natural automorphism psi of the identity functor on C in the sense uh, I described on the prior slide. Uh, so now this proof um, is quite technical and it's the most non-trivial aspect of the overall results uh, in that preprint. Um, so, so although uh, this, this result um, is the same as for pre-sheaves, uh, so far at least, um, its proof is still not obvious or, or non-trivial. And so, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so as for pre-sheave categories, if CJ is any small subcanonical site, in which no object is covered by the empty sieve, then the covariant isotropy group of that sheaf category is constant on the automorphism group of the identity functor of the base category. <clears throat> 
So now we, we want to hopefully remove the assumptions of sub canonicity and no object of being covered by the uh, empty sieve. So the the uh, the second property is is easier to to dispense with. So if we have any small subcanonical site which which doesn't necessarily have this property, one can find uh, pretty easily another subcanonical site um, which which does have this property. So in which no object is co covered by the empty sieve, and where the uh, the sheep categories are equivalent and the automorphism groups of the respective identity functors are isomorphic. So therefore, if CJ is any small subcanonical site where objects may or may not be covered by the empty sieve, then uh, the covariant isotropy group of the sheaf category is still constant on the automorphism group of the identity functor on the base category. So now, we want to consider uh, any small site, not necessarily subcanonical. <clears throat> so first, <clears throat> if we have any uh, locally small category E with a small, full, dense subcategory C, then I just proved this lemma saying that the automorphism groups of the identity functors on those two categories are isomorphic. <clears throat> so, and I use that to prove the following results. Uh, well, actually, next. Okay. So, if we have any small site CJ, not necessarily subcanonical, then uh, it's 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 well known that there is a subcanonical topology K on the small, full, dense subcategory uh, AYC. So that's just the uh, the subcat the full subcategory of the sheafifications of the representables, uh, for which uh, the original uh, topos is equivalent to the topos of sheaves on this uh, site. So then the covariant isotopy group of the original uh, sheaf topos is, is constant on the automorphism group of the identity functor on this full subcategory AYC. And by the lemma in the first uh, point, that's in turn isomorphic to the automorphism group of the identity functor on the actual topos. Uh, so basically, if we have any small site, not necessarily subcanonical, uh, or and where objects could be covered by the empty sieve, <clears throat> then the co covariant isotopy group of this topos is constant uh, on the automorphism group of the identity functor of the topos, which may also be called uh, the the uh, center of the topos. <clears throat> Okay, so in particular, since of course um, any pre sheaf category is known to be the, the category of sheaves for the trivial and subcanonical topology T on C, where only maximal sieves cover, we recover our early result for uh, pre sheaf toposes. Um, and now, if the site is not subcanonical, there is in general no, no relation between the automorphism groups of id C and the identity functor of the topos. So for example, um, if the automorphism group of id C is non-trivial, say for example, um, if C is the one object category corresponding to uh, an abelian group, um, which is non-trivial, then, and, and J is the topology where every sieve covers, then um, it's easy to show that J is not subcanonical and that the only sheaf is the terminal pre sheaf. And so the sheaf category is trivial, so that's the, uh, the automorphism group of the, of the uh, topos uh, is trivial, even though the um, automorphism group of id C is non trivial by assumption. And yeah, so our results uh, shows a major difference between covariant uh, and contravariant isotropy of of, um, of Grotendi topuses. So the latter was studied in this paper uh, called Isotropy and Cross Topuses by Funk, Kostra, and Steinberg. And they show that um, so contravariant isotropy is always representable by a sheaf of groups, while we have now shown that uh, covariant isotropy is always constant, and in fact, on the group of global sections of this uh, sheaf of groups. <clears throat> okay, so to start wrapping up, um, so via George Bergman's purely uh, categorical characterization of the inner automorphisms of groups, 
uh, covariant isotropy can be seen as giving a notion of conjugation or inner automorphism for arbitrary categories. So basically, um, you can define uh, an automorphism in an arbitrary category to be inner uh, if there is an extended inner automorphism of the object uh, that, that induces um, that uh, initial automorphism. Uh, or in other words, um, the automorphism is inner if it can be coherently extended along any map out of the object. Because this is the result that, that holds for uh, or that characterizes the inner automorphisms of groups defined in terms of conjugation. <clears throat> so we've characterized the co covariant isotropy group functor of T mod for any uh, lambda airy quasi equational theory T. So the, the covariant isotropy group of any model M or its group of extended inner automorphisms is isomorphic to the group of definable automorphisms of M. And this, uh, I think, I think, I think that this uh, characterization is most useful because it it can provide um, a more kind of uh, concrete or perhaps computational way uh, to to characterize the uh, the extended inner automorphisms of um, of a given model because um, those, I mean, the uh, the um, definition of extended inner automorphism does not kind of in itself allow for any obvious way to characterize them. Whereas if you work with the, uh, the syntax of a theory for which this category is the category of models, then via this isomorphism that kind of provides um, a more perhaps uh, down to earth computational co co concrete way to hopefully characterize uh, the covariant isotropy of the uh, category. Um, yeah, so using this, this, this results, we've shown that the characterization of covariant isotropy for pre-sheaf toposes that, um, that we achieved uh, earlier, in fact, essentially extends to all Grotendieke to, to toposes. So for any small and subcanonical site, uh, CJ, the covariant isotropy group uh, of the Grotendieke topos, is constant on the identity functor on C. And uh, as we saw before, uh, this basically amounts to saying that the only inner automorphisms of a sheaf on any such site are the ones induced by a natural automorphism of its C. <clears throat> so although this, this, this result shows that um, covariant isotropy as opposed to contravariant for grotten topuses is in some sense uh, degenerate or, or, or at least constant, the proof of this is, is still non-trivial. Um, and, and we also intend to build on this result to characterize the covariant isotropy of categories of sheaves of algebraic structures, uh, not just sets, which will be um, non-constant uh, in general. Since uh, in my thesis, I showed that, that um, the, the uh, covariant isotropy of categories of pre-sheaves of algebraic structures is, uh, is non-constant uh, in general. Okay, so that concludes my talk. Um, thanks very much. Oh, and, and I have some references here as well. Thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, your talk.